Hey, thanks for joining us at Connection Point Church. You know, we would love for you to stay connected and a simple way for you to do that is to subscribe so that each week you can get notified when new content goes live. We'd also love to keep in touch with you throughout the week and the best way to do this is through our Connection Point Facebook page. Now with all that being said, let's go to this week's message with our lead pastor, Zach Maddox. Welcome to Connection Point and welcome to all those joining us online. I'm Pastor Zach. Shelly and I serve as lead pastors here. So glad you've joined us today. If you were to talk to people today and ask them about the meaning of life or, or life after death, you'd probably come up with a lot of thoughts or ideas or answers. Uh, some people would say that uh, depending on how you live this life, you know, determines on, on the negative or positive consequences of your next life, that you're going to come back and, and the way that you live this life determines what you come back as in a second life. It's, it's reincarnation. Uh, some people would say that you're going to one day stand before God, that when you die, and, and so long as your good works outweigh your bad, maybe you'll get into heaven. Even then, it's only a maybe. Uh, I would say the prevailing view today is that this life is all there is. And the reason this matters, of course, there's lots of reasons it matters, but a big one is your view on life after death speaks loudly to your values and motives in this life. It changes the way you live. What your view of eternity is changes the way that you live now, or at least it should. And so this is why this is really important for us today. And, and so then the question is, well, who do you go to to be able to find answers to those questions about what is life for? Why am I alive? What does life after death look like? The, as we continue our series in Luke today, we find there's a, a group of people that they go and ask Jesus questions about life after death. They didn't know it, but they asked the best person they could have ever asked. The person who has the answers is our creator. They didn't know him as the son of God, but of course he showed us that he is through his resurrection from the dead. And so he's got the answers and we want to talk through those answers today. What does life look like after we die? So if you have your Bibles, hey, I hope you've got access to God's word. If you're new to Connection Point, we say that because we want you daily in God's word. We don't want you just in God's word on Sundays. If you don't have a Bible with you today, there's one underneath the chair in front of you. You're welcome to borrow that. If you don't have one at home, take it home as a gift from the church. But I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word, simply out of reverence that God gave his word to us, and so we don't take that lightly. And we're going to continue in Luke chapter 20, picking up from where we left off last week. We're going to be in verse 27, and this is where Luke writes. He says, there came to him some Sadducees, so came to Jesus, those who deny that there is a resurrection. And they asked him a question saying, teacher... Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children. And the second and the third took her. And likewise, all seven left no children and died. So part of the humor of the story is, this is not a woman you want to marry, right? <laughs> Just saying. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore, because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed, in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. These are the very words of God. You may be seated this morning. We left off in Luke last week talking about that we have been made in the image of God, and there's ways that we can reflect his image better. A big one was, is we've got to love the Lordship of Jesus, that if we love the Lordship of Jesus, fully surrender our lives to him, if, if we help others also reflect his image well, then we can reflect God's image in wonderful ways. We talked about the fact that we live in a community full of people who reflect the image of God. But the question is, are they reflecting his image well? And the follow-up question is, if they're not reflecting it well, what are we doing to help them reflect God's image 
in wonderful ways. That's part of what we need to do. And, and from our passage today, we find that when we reflect God's image well, we get to participate in the resurrection and live eternally with him. Resurrection matters. The question is, why? Well, the resurrection matters. It's a central teaching of our faith. Resurrection is a central teaching of our Christian faith. It's really important. After Jesus declares, give to Caesars what is Caesars and to God what is God's, some Sadducees, they come and ask Jesus about life after death. So this is from last week's passage. Basically, what they want to know is, will people be raised from the dead? That's what they're asking Jesus. The Pharisees, they believed in resurrection, but the Sadducees did not. There were three main sects or divisions of Judaism in the first century, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. The Sadducees, they tended to be rationalistic. They were usually wealthy. There were not as many Sadducees as there were Pharisees at the time of the first century. Uh, The Sadducees did not get along well with the Pharisees. And yet, even though they did not get along well, they usually were at odds with one another. It does seem they had a common enemy in Jesus. Because the Pharisees, if you remember last week, they sent spies to go ask Jesus questions to try to trip him up. It didn't work out, so now it's like the Sadducees are like, well, we'll give it a try and see what we can do, what we can come up with. Of course, it doesn't work for them either. <laughs> and so what they do is they, they share this ridiculous story, and it was actually common for them to use this story to kind of debunk the resurrection, the whose wife will she be question. The Sadducees, they really don't want an answer. They already are convinced the dilemma shows the lack of logic in a resurrection. They assume that even if an afterlife exists, which they're not really convinced of, well, then it must be like life now. And this question is important because a resurrection is at the center of what became the Christian hope. Resurrection's important. It's a central part of our doctrine. This is why on Easter, I I spent time answering the question, did Jesus rise from the dead? Because if he did not, Christianity's a hoax. But if he did, it should change the way that we live. We should be different. We should live different. If Jesus has been raised, our life is not the same. It's a good promise for us. I've shared, look, if somebody predicts their own death and resurrection and pulls it off, we listen to whatever that guy says. Right? That's why we're looking into Luke. Because we want to do what Jesus says. We want want to do what Jesus says not only tells us to do, but what he models for us to do. So what does Jesus tell the Sadducees? What he does is he replies in two ways. He explains that the afterlife, it's not like this life. There's no need for marriage because we'll have God in all of his fullness. We will have unfiltered access to the greatest and most intimate relationship we could ever have in life. It just looks different. I can't even imagine that. In other words, relationships, they're going to operate on a whole different plane in heaven. It's going to be very different. So I shared in first service. Now that doesn't mean I'm not going to chase Shelly all over eternity. Like, come look at this. Although we kind of joke, like she just came up here and said, like, heaven, I'll get rest. I'm like, but I'm still going to know you. How's that going to happen? (laughs) There's going to be lots of things to see. (laughs) I'm sorry, Shelly. But relationships, they will be different in eternity. And why will they be different? Because we're finally going to be complete. The the work that Jesus is doing in our lives right now, what we call sanctification, it will be done. And we will finally one day die our last death. You know, the I die daily. And then we're going to be alive in God and be totally different. We're going to have all of God. No more broken receptors. So every relationship will be redefined and made completely right and good. The quality and purity of relationships will extend far beyond what marriage provides today. That's what Jesus is saying. Evil will no longer cloud our relationships. And the quality of personal interaction will be driven by the presence of God. I can't even imagine that. Now, uh, to be honest, when when I was reading this passage, I struggle a bit with the fact that there's no marriage in heaven. I have a wonderful marriage. But the solace I have is understanding what we will have will be far above and beyond the most perfect marriage in this life. What a joy that we can have that. So Jesus explains to the Sadducees, the the afterlife is going to be different than life now. So it's like they asked Jesus the right question because Jesus knows things. What the Sadducees really knew nothing about, Jesus had knowledge of. And this is always the case, by the way. Jesus knows best in every circumstance, and every situation. 
This is a good, they were modeling for us things that they didn't even know. If we've got questions, we know who has the answer. May we always go to the one who has answers for our life. And the second thing that Jesus tells the Sadducees is those worthy of resurrection, the children of God, they will be the children of resurrection. Paul, a New Testament follower of Jesus, he talks about how Jesus' resurrection is the proof of our own future resurrection. Here's what he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But I want to help explain the context in the setting. So Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I used this passage when I was talking about the resurrection of Jesus. What Paul first does is he says, here is proof of the resurrection. Here's who saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. And he gives a laundry list of people. And he says, oh, by the way, they're still alive. So if you don't believe me, go ask them yourself. So he's got this proof of the resurrection. But then he gets into this passage because apparently some of the believers in Corinth or some of the people that were there, they were not believing that that necessarily meant that we were going to rise from the dead. So Paul addresses that. He says, but tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. And we apostles would be all lying about God, for we've said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ, they're lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in this world. But here's the clincher. But in fact, because Paul's already said it in the verses above it, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And that's the joy we have. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, so death came in through Adam. Now the resurrection from dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies, because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ, the children of God, those who have devoted their lives to him, they shall be raised as the first of the harvest, then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. So what he's, Paul is saying is, Jesus is the first, the first fruits of a coming harvest of resurrection. We are people of the resurrection. And because Jesus has been raised, we can be confident we will be too. And if you're unsure about the resurrection of Jesus, I encourage you, go back, listen to that Easter message. You know, was Jesus resurrected from the dead? I want you to be firm in that because resurrection is real. There is life after death. And this matters for several important reasons. Resurrection shows us a couple of important things. The first is that resurrection shows us we are accountable to God. So resurrection, there's some implications. If we're going to be raised from the dead, here are things that we need to consider. We're accountable to God. You know, some people would say that this is all we've got. This is life, all that life that we have, so live it up. Basically, a, a get, get everything you can from this life kind of mentality. And I would say part of that statement is true. This life is all we have. But at the end of our life, we will be held accountable to God for the way in which we live. Life's not like, you know, elementary school where a person can repeat a grade if failure occurs. It's not like we stand before God and he's like, you know, could have done a better job. Try again. It doesn't work that way. That's not what eternity is. So instead of getting everything we can from this life, we should instead pay careful attention to how we can better walk with God and live on mission for him. Because that's a life that honors him. We must live as we've been created to live. We've got to live the way we've been created to live. Most of the problems people are facing today is because they're not living by God's design. If we live by God's design, everything is different for us. The reality of resurrection and the prospect of being considered worthy of taking part, it means that we should be careful what we believe and how we respond. As we've been working through Luke, we've covered a lot of the parables and stories of Jesus. And so I just wanted to go back to one of those today from Luke chapter 12. I had shared a message called Wake Up. It's back from uh, September of last year. I would even encourage you, go back and listen to that message because it's all about preparing for the day when Jesus comes again. It's a good message for us to consider as we look at eternity. Because here's what Jesus shares in that, 
passage. He says, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants who the master finds awake when he comes. We are meant to walk and live life awake. We should not be sleepwalking through life. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table. He will come and serve them. Can you imagine Jesus serving you? If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Are you living a ready life? Peter said, Lord, are you telling, (laughs) gotta love Peter, Lord, is this just for me or can everybody take part in this accountability? That's what he's asking. (laughs) And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion at food at the proper time? So he's saying his servants are those who not only feed themselves, but they feed others. Jesus for me, Jesus for others. Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all of his possessions. Again, the reward of following Jesus is greater responsibility because with greater responsibility comes more of Jesus. Because the longer you walk with Jesus, the longer, the more you realize how you can do nothing without him. So he gives you more responsibility to realize I need more of Jesus. The reward is more of Jesus because he gives you greater responsibility. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given of him, much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. Jesus expects us to live ready lives. He expects that you will find Jesus for yourself and extend Jesus to others. What Jesus is saying is his followers should prepare for his return by living in a way that honors him when he comes to assess our walk with him. Because everyone, Peter makes it clear, everyone's going to be held accountable to Jesus for the way in which they lived. Everyone. So how are we preparing for that day when Jesus comes again or we're going to stand before him? And then the question comes, well, how do we honor Jesus with our lives? And I'm sure you're going to be surprised by the answer to that question. We've been talking about it for like three plus years now. You become an everyday disciple maker, <laughs> maybe a different language, but it's all the same through the New Testament. As you live with that goal of Jesus for me and Jesus for others, and you pursue that in the way in which you live your life, that's a life that honors the Lord. I hope you're committed to becoming an everyday disciple maker. We're committed as a church to helping you become that. We're working very hard to figure out how can we do a better job of helping you fulfill the life that God has for you to live by his design. And the simple part for you is at least just dive in, serve on a volunteer team, start to get to know others who are here. Jump in a connect group. There's lots of options for you to get to know others. As you start to embed yourself in this body here, we're going to figure out good ways to help equip you and watch what God does through your life. It's our commitment to you to help figure that out. And now from this passage and others, we see that we're going to be held accountable for the way that we live our lives. It's all throughout the New Testament. And I've come to realize that too often we've bought into the lie that our work is worship and nothing else is required. There was this theology for a long time, and it's still out there, that our jobs are worship to the Lord. And I would say, yes, that is true. But I think we also need to take a higher view that says our jobs are positions for ministry in my community. That we need to understand the people of whom we have been sent to, which is your workplace, by the way, they are the people that God has in our lives by his design. And the question is, are we sharing good news with them? And I say that fully well knowing that you may need to find creative ways to do that sometimes. But I will say this, if you're living a spiritually obvious life, people find you. So are you living a spiritually obvious life? Are you being a proclaimer? It's important that you are. I will say at the end of the day, two things, basic necessities. We all need to eat and we all need to live indoors. Some guys may disagree with that second statement. 
But really, it's good that you live indoors. We all need to eat, we all need to live indoors. So, but once your needs are met, then the question is, what are you doing with the position that God has granted you? Have you only shown up for the paycheck or have you also shown up for the people? God has people in your life for a reason. Shelley had shared last week how we need, need to live lives of proclamation. It's important that we do that. And, and then, wouldn't you know it, Dick Brogdon decided to write a devotional this week from his Live Dead series talking about this. Here's what he said. Was anybody here last November when Dick was here, Dick Brogdon? So he likes to say things. So, you know, Jesus says, don't be offended. So I would say, don't be offended by Dick in the first line here, okay? One of the most irritating fake quotes that has gained popularity. Isn't that Dick Brogdon? Reminds me of Peter sometimes. <laughs> one of the most irritating fake quotes that has gained popularity is the one allegedly spoken by St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. It's irritating because Francis never said it. He never lived it. And frankly, it's un. Biblical. We must always use words. The gospel is news that must be delivered. We are voices crying in the wilderness. We are witnesses not called to the gospel stand uh, to pantomime, but to clearly point to Jesus in his definitive work on the cross. Let us be clear and committed to being heralds and town criers. We are not the solution. We are not the answer, but we know who is. And we must lift up our voice and direct attention to him. Yes, our silence damages as much as our pompous or angry words. And I would say this, the reason we change that core value of share the story of Jesus to now it is share the good news is because it should be good news coming out of our mouths, not angry talk, right? We need to be careful that we're good news carriers. But the solution is not to withdraw our words and hope our actions magically convince. The disciple maker's spirit is to make sure our heart is right pure, loving, and lowly, so that when our mouth speaks, as it must, out of the abundance of the heart flows abundant gospel grace to all nations. Let us learn how to live as everyday disciple makers, because we will be held accountable for the life that we have lived. Are you on a pathway toward everyday disciple making? I would encourage you, if you're not, starting point is, jump in on a volunteer team and connect groups. Talk to the Main Street Theater. They'll help you do that today. Resurrection shows us we're accountable to God. And resurrection also shows us we're going to live eternally. Resurrection shows us we are eternal beings. Regarding the resurrection, uh, this is a really important part. We do not just go to heaven when we're raised from the dead. We are actually transformed. When we go to heaven, yes, it's a place. But guess what? It's going to be a people who are resurrected. And they're going to look different. It's not going to look like how we look today. Paul writes about this as he continues in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So what he's doing here, Paul is talking to the Corinthian believers. He says, here's the proof of the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, because he has been raised, we know we will be too. I know here, here's, here's an additional thought. When you're raised, you're not going to look like you do now. Here's what he says. But someone may ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question. When you put a seed into the ground. Let me back up for a second. What a foolish question. You know, I was a teacher for a lot of years. And other teachers, I didn't hang this particular painting on my wall. It was, the only stupid question is one not asked. I think Paul would say, that statement is untrue. What a foolish question. When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you're planting. Farmers understand this stuff. Look, they don't put a stalk of corn in the ground so that more stalks of corn come up. No, it doesn't work that way. So what you put in the ground is different than what comes above the ground. That's what Paul is saying. God gives it to the new body. He wants it to have. A different, uh, a different plant grows from each kind of seed. Similarly, there are different kinds of flesh. One kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are also bodies in the heavens and bodies on the earth. The glory of the heavenly bodies is different from the glory of the earthly bodies. The sun has one kind of glory, while the moon and the stars each have another kind. And even the stars differ from each other in their glory. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to life forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They're buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. 
They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. What a wonderful picture we have from Paul. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. The scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last man, Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body. Then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. Praise the Lord. What I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Like they can't contain it. That's what he's saying. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. No more hip surgeries. No more knee surgeries. I don't know how many people I have visited for those issues. Lord, help us. We know that these earthly bodies can't contain it. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sins its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death and through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. What he's saying is, Jesus is going to make you new. So work enthusiastically for him. Nothing you do is useless. It's important we understand that life after the resurrection, it takes place in a transformed community where evil no longer exists. It's gone. And we live right now in a world so full of evil, it's hard to appreciate how wonderful eternity will be. I don't think we can understand it. But God assures us he will make us like himself. It's not just where we're going that makes our hope so great. It's who we're going to be when we get there. What a wonderful day that'll be. So are you living, looking forward to eternity with God? Do you long for that life? Or are you simply trying to get everything you can from this one? Live in light of eternity because the people of God are the people of resurrection. We need to consider that. Resurrection shows us we're accountable to God and we'll live eternity. So live a life worthy of resurrection by becoming that everyday disciple maker. Are you a good news carrier? It's often been said that death is a great equalizer, since we all must die. Yet resurrection is the great opportunity, since we all have a chance to enter into eternal life. Everyone in this room, everyone outside these walls has been invited to eternity with God. That's why we've been wearing that shirt. We have this invitation with God. Have you accepted it? The Sadducees, what I, what I appreciate about this passage is they were modern people in an ancient time. They questioned both the existence of angels and the resurrection. That's not very much unlike today. They were committed materialists, dedicating to pursuing life on this earth and maxing it out, which is what you would do if you don't think there's life after death. That's the right response. It's how most people in our community live. But on the other hand, we're eternal and we know it. And the life we live now is what echoes in eternity. So we'd better choose wisely how we live out our days, knowing this life on earth is but a hiccup when compared with all of eternity. It's but a blink. I was asked in between services, they're like, you know, I was waiting for the rope to come out. <laughs> if you're not here, if you haven't been here for some of those messages, I've, I usually have a rope that goes off into like the parking lot from this stage. And I just tape on the end of it to say, here's this life we're living and here's what's yet to come. Why are we living for the tape portion of our lives when we get to live for eternity? Let's live in light of eternity. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and in between the two passages that I read this morning, so Paul says, Jesus has been resurrected, so we will be resurrected. And then he gets a little bit later to say, and when you're resurrected, this is what that's going to look like. But in between those two passages are a couple of verses that are very important for us to consider as we close. Paul writes, after that, the end will come. After Jesus has come again, the end will come. 
when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And that is a joy for those who are friends of Jesus, but it is a terror to those who are enemies of God. And we fall in one of two categories. And so do your neighbors, and so do your coworkers. And so the question is, what are you doing to help them become friends of God? And the second question is, are you a friend of God today? Because it is his will that none should perish. It is not his desire to humble people and to make them enemies of God. That, that is not what he set out to do. But he also knows that he cannot force us to love him. So do you love God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength? And do you love your neighbor as yourself? How are you living for Jesus? Because it's God's desire to live eternally with you, but you've got to make a decision to follow him. Will you make that today? I'm going to invite you to stand as we close in song this morning. And before we sing, I want to ask that question. Maybe you're here today and you've had questions about life after death. What's the meaning of life? And God gives us answers. But the question is, are we seeking him for those answers? Are we looking elsewhere? If you want the answers this morning, he's given them to us. And he invites us to make a, a response to that. So if you're here today and you'd say, I, I'm not a follower of Jesus, I've not devoted my life to him, then what Jesus would say is, well, right now, you're not a friend of mine. But it's his desire that you are. So with every head bowed in this room, that's where you find yourself to say, I am not a follower of Jesus, I am not a friend of his, but I would like to be today. I invite you to raise your hand and I'm gonna pray with you before we leave today. Walk out of here, friend of God, knowing with full confidence you're granted eternity in his name. Anybody here today would say, that's me, I'm, I'm not a follower of Jesus, I've not devoted my life to him, but I wanna do that today before I leave from this space. We're meant to have confidence as children of God, that we are children of the resurrection. And are you living in that kind of confidence today? The second thing I'd like to ask is maybe you're here today and you've made a decision to follow Jesus, but you really haven't been living in light of eternity. In fact, you even lack the confidence that you're a child of God and are going to be a child of the resurrection. But today you'd like to, to say, you know what, I'd, I'd love the confidence in walking out of this space that I'm gonna live forever with God, that my life honors him. So anybody that would like me to, to pray with them before you leave, that you would have that kind of God confidence today. Anybody would say, that's me. I, I'm lacking confidence and I'm a child of God, a child of the resurrection, and I just want to be prayed with today. Anybody would say, that's me. God, we just thank you that you provided a way for us to have a relationship with you. Lord, that we were enemies of God, but you made us friends by sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, that our, our evil hearts might be made right and clean and pure in your name. And God, we just thank you that there is coming a day where we will no longer need to die daily, that we will die our final death and we will live in you forever. So God, I just pray for everyone in this room that they would have the confidence that as they commit their lives to you, that they can confidently know that they'll live forever with you one day. And Lord, in the in-between, in between now and, and forever, I pray, Jesus, that we would honor you with our lives. Pray, Jesus, that we commit ourselves to becoming everyday disciple makers who, who are good news proclaimers with the way that we live, that we live spiritually obvious lives so people ask questions. And Lord, that we can then point them to you. So Jesus, we're not the answer, but we know the one who is. So God, I pray that we would, in everything that we do, direct all attention to you, King Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that you continue changing lives. God, as we sing this last song, I just pray that we dedicate that to you and our lives of service to your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray.